Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to everybody who's, who's joining our webinar today. Thank you so much for being here. Sorry for the, the couple of minutes delay. Um, as usual, there's the, the usual Zoom, Zoom technical issues. Um, but we're really, really glad to welcome you here. And we've got a fantastic panel of speakers uh, today. Um, and I'll just introduce them very briefly um, and ask them to wave so you can see who is who. We've got with us um, Dr. Zahid Awan, who's the Inclusive Eye Health Projects Manager at CBM. Can you say a quick hello, Dr. Zahid? Thank you for joining us. Hi. Thank you. Um, fantastic. And we've got uh, Michelle Henley. She's the Divisional Lead for Optometry and Visual Sciences at City University of London. And Irene. Hi, I mean. Hi, hello. And Irene Katori, who's the Associate Dean of Education um, at um, also at, um, at City University of London. And we've got. Hi, from Hi, thank you. Um, finally, we've got Dr. Dr. Hilary Rono, um, who's an ophthalmologist at Kitali County and Referral Hospitals, Kitali in Kenya. Um, so we'll start off. Hi. So what Hi. we're going to do is we can ask them. everyone. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rono. Um, so we, we're going to start this morning um, with the presentations. We're going to have Dr. Awan speaking first and sharing his, his presentation with us. And then uh, we'll, we'll have some time for questions, about 10 minutes for questions. Um, next up will be Michelle and Irene. And finally, we'll have uh, Dr. Hilary Rono with his, um, with his presentation about what's happening in Kenya. Okay, so um, Dr. Awan, I would love for you to start. Do you want to share your screen? Uh, thank you very much. I think you, I would request you if, you, if he's able to share the screen for me. Oh, there, there we, we go. go. If you just want to pop your camera off, I'll mean, and then. Yeah, absolutely. Please go ahead. Okay. I, so I haven't the rights to share. Um, okay, he, thank you. He was, yeah, doing it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is Dr. Zahid Awan, uh, working in CBM as a pro projects manager. And I am presenting my CBM and districts, peak districts in Pakistan, how technology, technology has enabled us to reach to the unreached. Please, next slide. Next, please. Yes, well, we are working in, C in Pakistan since 1968. Our aim is to provide comprehensive inclusive eye care services, inclusion in eye health programs, and mainly system strengthening uh, through aligning national eye health system. Next, please. Uh, next. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is our CBM's technology enabled district model approach where we start a screening from the community through lady health workers and then basic health units and rural health centers. This is the primary level. From the basic health units, the patients are referred to the rural health center where we have established intermediary clinic that is uh, that aligns with the integrated people-centered eye care plan that how intermediary clinics supports this program. And then again, the patients are referred, the patient, DT patients who needs spectacles, they are referred to the optical shops and who the patient that need uh, further sophisticated treatment, they are referred to the secondary and tertiary level further. Just wanted to let you know, from the community up to the tertiary, the technology is active. It's a paperless activity that we are doing here. Regarding rural health center, this, this covers about 150,000 to 100,000 people. And the basic health unit that covers about 10,000 to 15,000 uh, people into the locality. And basic health unit is the smallest health unit in Pakistan. Please, second. Next, please. Yes. <clears throat> technology, by virtue of this technology, we enabled the connectivity of the patients through referral links. It strengthened uh, the referral links because once it is 
uh, the patient was referred from the community, it is being checked out, it is being cross verified, and 84% that this is our uh, three studies says that 84% persons are linked and the referrals uptake is there at the intermediary and the next level. In addition to the primary level, we have strengthened the secondary eye care services as well. If you see in the graph in the, uh, into this chart, that previously the 41% of the refraction was done at secondary level. By virtue of introducing technology and the peak technology, it has been reduced to 1%. And same, that is the cataract surgeries are increased. Next, please. Next, please. Yes. Thank you. Now, just this, this is this just wanted to show when we started working uh, uh, in the in this programs. If you see, there was very minimal eye care services at the primary level, and medical and surgical and refraction, all the things were done at the secondary level, and the tertiary level having no linkages with the secondary. That means there was no formal linkages with the tertiary, although the patients were by themselves, they were uptaking services at the tertiary level. But by virtue of this technology, now screening refraction are done and, and the referrals are done at the primary level, while the most of the surgeries and the refraction, that they are done at the primary, but the only surgery is done at the secondary level. And the tertiary level is also linked through this technology and the loop is closed, that patient starts from community, the loop ends at, uh, at the tertiary level. Next, please. Uh, my conclusion is that mobile technology helped to optimize primary eye health care and CBM peak districts in Pakistan, thereby increasing access to specialist eye health for those who need it. The major thing that I wanted to let all know that the technology has created easiness into the life of the people. It has reduced the waiting time. It has reduced the companion uh, issue to that the burden the patient had. Now the, all the services are at those step. And if anyone who's a needy person is needing referred, like an example that out of 100 patients, only 13 patients need secondary level services. This is the live study and live data we have. And only 1% out, out of that 13% that needs tertiary level. Why if government and other organizations introduces this technology into their countries, I think the load of the tertiary level hospitals will reduce and also the secondary level. By virtue of these, the quality surgical services would be provided at secondary level and also the tertiary level hospitals would have a, enough time, ample time to do academics and research work rather than check. They are sitting to check the visual equity and treating the, uh, the conjunctivitis. Next, please. Uh, you next, please. Yes, these are our partners, organization where we work. Uh, we have a peak uh, uh, partner as a they are service provider and the digital solutions, and they are the peak custodians. They are very, uh, I must say that they are very cooperative and they do a lot of work for, uh, in Pakistan in strengthening our system. Government of Pakistan, government of Sin, government of Punjab, and partners that College of Ophthalmology, Allied Visual Sciences. Sin Institute of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences, they are our partners in, uh, in managing this uh, a, a very hard task that looks very easy for CBM to continue with their support. Thank you very much. Next, please. So thank you very much. This was my uh, talk. So uh, I would love to receive any question and uh, explanation if needed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Owen. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, we're now going to open up for questions. So please, you can um, either raise your hand to ask a question um, or you can put your questions in the chat. But ideally, we'd love to see you. So if we can enable you to, um, we'll, I don't know if we can do video. Um, no, but we can allow you to talk. So it'd be lovely to hear your voices and hear who is here. So Hugh, can you give us a hand? There we go. If you can unmute. There we go. 
I'm still looking for hands up. I'm not the most technically minded person. So he, would you mind unmuting and just giving us a bit of guidance about how this works and perhaps directing our, our um, um, participants? I, I don't think we have any hands up at the moment. So yeah, if, if everyone could oh. please um, just, yeah, put, put questions in the Q&A or, or raise your hand um, and we can allow you to, to talk. In the meantime, perhaps... Um, if there's any yeah. questions from yourself, Almin, or from the other speakers. Yes, yes. I just, I wanted to know, Dr. Owen, um, more or less how long, you know, if, if somebody in another country wanted to implement something like that without a, without a, a charitable partner like CBM, um, what are the costs that you'd be looking at? Um, and how do you start? I mean, where do you start if you wanted to do something like this where you are? Can you repeat the question, please? Sorry, I couldn't hear. Uh, yeah, please. Can you repeat your question, please? No, I was just saying, um, I mean, this is such an inspiring experience that you're having and the results are so so positive. How would how could someone in another country get started with if, if they wanted to implement something similar where they are? Uh, yes, thank you very much. That's a very interesting question. Uh, for that, for example, if they want to introduce a technology, uh, first of all, they need to learn that how much primary infra, primary health care infrastructure is work, working in, in their country. First, that is done. Then I think they need to know that they need to know how much the HR they have. And for mm -hmm. technology, I think the uh, peak vision uh, that is uh, that we, the CBM has contact, contracted so far, so I think that is the technology that the people, that anyone from the country, whether the government or whether the international or NGO or a national organization, they can reach them and they can provide their services to start with. And then uh, this would be the best option for them uh, to, to get started in any country uh, in the world. Mm. Yes, it very much depends on, on what you have available. And I think Pakistan is... is... Not unique in the world, but your lady health worker system is is incredible and in, in how it reaches really deep into the community where everyone is. Um, so yeah, it, it would have to be a, a whole country, I guess, at a, a national level where a program like this, or, or at least a district level where a program like this would have to be implemented. But thank you so much. Um, are there any other questions for Dr. Awan about the project from anyone? Ah, Irene, please go ahead. Thank you, and thank you, um, um, Dr. Arm, for such an interesting talk. Uh, I'm interested to hear what sort of additional digital training, I guess, is needed for, for the practitioners on the ground delivering this. So was it something that was well received or, or required a lot of extra training in order to use the, 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 um, the mobile apps, for example, the PCAPs? caps? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, the, the beauty of this pro program is that uh, uh, we do not use the specialist cadre. We use non-specialist cadre for a screening in, in eye care. You know, lady health workers, lady health visitors, they are non-specialist cadre. Yes, they need training. Uh, they need training on two things. One, that is the primary eye care. That's very necessary. That non-reflective conditions needs to be identified by them. And second, on, on Androids, because we, we used to use Android for using this peak technology. So uh, ultimately they need training on Android first and then on the peak capture and the peak solutions that we used to use. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, I had another question. Um, the mobile phones that, that they use, are, how common is mobile phone use amongst the primary healthcare workers, the lady healthcare workers. So, I mean, you said they needed some training in Android phones first. So, um, are these phones their personal phones, or are they just for work? Are they limited to to work, or do you get them kind of used to the the whole concept of using mobile phones first? Uh, yeah, thank you. Currently, uh, because this is this is a pilot program, and we are piloting in the country, so all the mobile devices are provided by the CBM, and powered by peak vision so anybody in in uh, that is that is the training are non special scatter for a screener that were the way we use we mm -hmm. use to provide them training and yes now in pakistan almost 90 percent of the people are using this android devices so there's a no problem for them to use even the software that we provide for screening and capturing data 
That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Alwan. Um, we've got a question from Robert Alibo. I hope I'm saying your name correctly, Robert. Please go ahead. You're able to talk now. Hi. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Zaid Alwan. Uh, my question relates with um, the way the information that is gathered through PEAK, is it able to communicate with national uh, health information systems so that there's seamless of data transfer from PEAK to that, that database? What was the experience in Pakistan? Yeah, thank you very much. We have a very good experience on that. What we did when we started introducing PEAK technology in our program, we looked into our data, our plans that what indicators actually we are collecting together uh, for, for information, for our information system. Uh, currently, uh, and then we looked in that what our integrated people-centered eye care plan says, whatever the indicators are incorporated into that plan, integrated centered eye care plan, we try to capture the data in aligning with that. Uh, so the data, whatever collecting uh, through that peak capture, that aligns with the indicators that are already available in the plan. The second question that how much uh, it, it could be incorporated into the governmental systems, and I think everybody is aware that we have that currently uh, DHIS is shifting to DHIS2, and Pakistan is also one of, one of the country that has taken steps. So we are struggling with the government. A CBM, along with his governmental partners, is struggling with the government to incorporate the same indicator uh, that is available in the integrated people center eye care plan. And I, I cannot say that today, uh, at, at this moment, I can't say anything, but surely in next five, three to five years or three years, the data, all the data that is available in the plan would be incorporated and that aligns with our programs that currently we are implementing. Thank you. Thank you. It's brilliant. Okay, I don't see any other questions. We will have some time at the end. Um, so if Almin, any... sorry, oh, we've got some oh. questions in the Q and A at the moment. Oh, fantastic! Brilliant. Thank you. Go yes. for it. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. So um, we've got Charles uh, Kadua who said, "Do screeners use their own uh, mobile phones? Are they procured for them by the program? Um, and also, what measures are put in place for patient confidentiality?" Hmm. Can, can you you can you repeat it, please? Yes, definitely. So the first question is: uh, Do screeners use their own mobile phones, or are they given those by the program? Yes, the mobiles are given by the programs. Fantastic. And then the second question was around um, patient confidentiality within the yeah, peak patient, system. patient compliance. As I already mentioned during my speech, that uh, eighty-four percent of the people comply with the services. Like, for example, 100 patients are referred from one center to second center, 84% arrives at the next level. So this is the compliance. That compliance has increased much, much more than with what we were doing with the conventional approaches. Um, Dr. Owen, just to, just to clarify, it's about a confidentiality, not compliance. Oh, sorry. No, no, it's, okay. it's just, it's, it's, oh, it's always like, the, like this, isn't it? So it's about how do, um, how, what is put in place for patient confidentiality? Yeah, uh, just I wanted to let you know, that whenever we start our program, uh, there is a, a MOU that we use to sign that is called data processing agreement. And that is with the governmental partners. It means that data will never be uh, leaked out and that not will not be handed over. Another thing, the peak capture has a quality that nobody can access except those who have the access. Even CBM country office, uh, if we are two or three persons in the country office, only one person have an access to check the data. And at the partner end, there's only one person that is the uh, IT lead, we used to say information technology lead, who deals with the capture he has the access to use the data, not to use the data, but have the access to look at the data. And the data is available in cloud, so nobody can have access. So it's a highly confidential data, highly confidential graphs, what we use to prepare. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank, thank you so much. That's really helpful. Did that answer the question? So please um, please feel free to pop back on the chat or to raise your hand. Uh, and to, to say to raise your hand, um, these reactions at the bottom, 
I think um, we should have maybe gone through that. Um, there's a few other questions coming through. Um, just about charging, Hannah Fall has asked, how about charging the phones? How's that done? Uh, is there good electricity available or is there alternative power, like solar power that's used? Um, Dr. Uh, yeah, in Pakistan, uh, almost uh, at the health facilities, there is electricity. And mm -hmm. wherever the lady health workers are working, there is electricity. But in any case, for example, and the life of the battery, the mobiles that we used to use, that's a standard mobile, and that has the battery life of about 12 hours to 24 hours, a minimum 12 hours to 24 hours, they can run. For example, any, uh, uh, and, and the mobiles that, that they use, they use the, the screeners used to take them along with their, in their homes, and there's electricity, they charge it up. Okay, thank you very, very much. I think because of time, we're gonna, we've still got some questions in the Q&A and hopefully we can come back to those or we can answer them um, in the chat. Um, we're going to now move on to the next talk today, which is going to be about using technology and communications technology for teaching. So, Dr. Owen, thank you very, very much for your time. I hope we have time for those questions at the end. So, Thanks. speaking now will be um, Michelle Henley and um, and Irene, uh, or Katori, sorry, sorry about that, Irene. Um, and they'll be speaking about using technology for, for teaching. Okay, so I'll, I'll please go ahead. There we go. Thank you, Almin. Um, I'll be taking the first half and then Irene will be joining me um, halfway through. So thank you, um, everyone. Uh, really lovely to be here today. I'm here to talk to you about technology in education, uh, something we've learned uh, a lot about, I guess, in the last couple of years, thanks to COVID. So we now have uh, a great deal of experience in delivering um, education via technology and now we're we're probably a bit more aware of the advantages and disadvantages of the different types. Uh, next slide please. So what is online learning? So essentially it's a way of delivering education over the internet using the online virtual environment. As we know educational content is constructed using principles of teaching and learning, pedagogy, and this supports student progression and success. However, it's important to change how we structure this content to reflect the change in the mode of delivery. I mentioned success, and that's really key, particularly in the online learning environment, uh, because success is really um, essential and is built on the ability to create an inclusive, accessible, an interactive environment. These factors all support engagement and engagement equals success for all students and eye care practitioners. Um, of course, online learning improves access to education, which is, has to be a major advantage and also it improves the flexibility for people. So for people that live a long distance away, or for people with work commitments or with family or caring commitments, they can have access to education and can tailor the learning according to their circumstances. Next slide, please. So the first type of online learning that we're going to discuss is synchronous learning. So that's essentially live learning. And this is where students share the same virtual space as their tutors and fellow students and can ask questions and interact in a range of different ways. So in terms of the live presentation, so that can form a lecture or a demonstration, or it can be a small group discussion. And we tend to use two different types of video platforms, um, which I'm sure you're familiar with. So that's Zoom or Microsoft Teams. Of course, the disadvantage with synchronous uh, learning is that you are reliant upon a stable, um, connection to the internet, it is really essential. And of course, if timing um, can also prove to be a, a challenge be if students are based in different time zones. So consideration has to be made for the timing of these sessions. Uh, next slide. So in terms of using synchronous technology, um, as I mentioned, we, we tend to focus on Zoom and Microsoft Teams. The advantages of these video conferencing tools is that there is automatic captioning. 
You can also use breakout rooms so that students can work in small groups and they now integrate polls and quizzes. Um, there are other interactive tools that, that we use regularly and that would be Poll Everywhere, Mentimeter, Padlet, Miro is another example. These are all free uh, software tools and they enable polling, surveys, Q and A's, quizzes and word clouds. And they're really very important within um, the context of online learning because it allows a, a formative real-time assessment of students' knowledge. So one can see that or, or check that students have grasped key points and also whether they're attaining the learning outcomes that have been set. Um, other tools include Discord and Slack, not, not used quite to the same extent within the educational forum. Um, but these provide topic-based channels for broadcasting live video or audiovisual materials. And of course, OneDrive and Google uh, Docs also support synchronous and asynchronous learning. So students can work live on a document together or they can work on a document in their own time. Okay, next slide, please. So in terms of asynchronous learning, this, uh, some in some ways resolves the issues around a reliable, stable internet connection and also the timing issue if there's students are in different time zones. Um, but there are disadvantages with this type of learning as well, and that's namely around uh, building a community and a sense of belonging for students. So in terms of trying to support that, knowing that that's a disadvantage, we can tailor the material that we provide um, to help support students better. So in terms of asynchronous learning, we can provide lecture videos, notes, quizzes, uh, question papers, worked examples. And of course, the major advantage of this type of learning is that students can work at their own pace um, and in their own time. So it, it tends to be done at a time that is convenient for them in light of work commitments or family commitments or indeed caring commitments. Um, in terms of tailoring what we do for asynchronous learning, I think it's important that the recordings are shorter, so that helps with engagement, and of course the use of transcripts as well, so it solves for that issue with the internet connection, and it also helps to build that sense of engagement um, and sense of community. Um, but we also need to employ other tools to further build that sense in the asynchronous environment. Um, one way students can communicate is via discussion boards or in the chat, but there are other tools available. Next slide, please. Uh, so in terms of asynchronous technology, what we tend to use for um, the structuring of the learning is a learning platform, otherwise known as a virtual learning environment. And this essentially is a one-stop shop for all of the student material that they would need. So it would include reading materials, recordings with, with transcripts, discussion forums, and interactive quizzes. Um, the main ones that are used would be Moodle, uh, Blackboard, and Google Classroom. Um, other tools as well include uh, WhatsApp, which can create peer-to-peer -peer support which is really helpful in building that sense of community. And also Padlet, WordPress and other blog websites can be used by students to publish group projects or write individual reflections on their learning. Um, Quizlet is also another free software whereby you can uh, make flashcards so students can comment on, again, focusing on that peer-to-peer -peer learning and also uh, share with their tutor. So I'm going to pass on now to uh, Irene, who's going to talk more about the learning platforms and other ways of further engaging students in the online environment. Thank you very much, Michelle. 
So I think, as you have um, just heard from Michelle, there, there are a range of ways of engaging with students online and it can all be very confusing. So our learning platforms are really key to being able to bring all of that together in a virtual classroom, if you like. So we use our learning platforms, for example, something like Moodle to bring together the asynchronous material and the synchronous material all in one place. And by that, we can add links to lectures, links to webinars, for example, what we're doing just now, um, and also harness the use of Microsoft Teams within Moodle so that the student feels that everything is connected and these activities don't sit as isolated um, components of the teaching. What's really important is how the students can access Moodle, and this can be via a computer, a laptop, um, or even their smartphone. And that's indeed something that we found was very um, popular with students when we first went into COVID, and not every student had a computer or a laptop um, uh, available to them. So with that in mind, it's really important that activities that are designed for such delivery have to be inclusive and accessible, irrespective of the means by which students are, are accessing this material. Thank you. Next slide. In order to increase the engagement um, with students, the platform should include an opportunity for a discussion forum. That could be through a typed mechanism, so a question posted onto a, like a chat room, if you like, and then students respond to each other and also with the lecturer. And that's an opportunity to share ideas and experience and also to ask advice. In order to be able to reach students, it, the platform should also enable educators to send emails to the students as one cohort. Again, bring it all together in one place. And the tools um, can also be embedded, things like quizzes um, can all be embedded depending on the platform in a similar way. Thank you, next slide. So really just to, to finish um, the uh, our talk off and bring it all together, um, this is all, uh, online teaching is all a way of in harnessing and increasing learn learner engagement. And it's really important that there's good interaction between the educators and the students and also between the students um, on, in this online environment. And for that to work well, it needs to be planned and supported by the technology. Discussion forums and the like need to be responded to in a timely manner so that the students feel that they are engaging in a, in a meaningful way. And by interacting with students in this way, we can help to bridge some gaps, motivate students and show some understanding and provide support in a way that we were not able to um, in the sort of in-person classroom. So educator facilitation is, as part of content delivery is a key factor in determining the student engagement and performance. But what we mustn't forget and what we alluded to before is that students may need that support with digital literacy at the outset so that this doesn't sort of fall by the wayside and leave them behind. And just as a final thought, I thought it was, um, it was good to, to link back to what Dr. Arwan said um, right at the, the very start, um, talking about how it's so important to harness technology in education, because ultimately our practitioners will be going out and using this technology in the, in the workplace, in the clinical environment. So it's important that we are offering students education in this manner to, um, to, to equip them for the future. Thank you, that brings us to the end uh, of our talk. Thank you so much, Irene and Michelle, that was a great talk. Um, we're opening up for questions again, so please raise your hand by clicking on the reactions button. Uh, we've got one coming in, coming already from N Nandini Vasudevan. Excuse me if I mispronounce your name. We have been facing challenges in ensuring students are online throughout and track their attendance. Students tend to turn off their video in spite of us emphasizing time and again to keep the videos on. Would you have possible suggestions to overcome this? Yeah, I can I can answer this and then uh, Michelle, please come in. Um, I think there's a couple of things to consider and things that we were hearing from our students were it was really interesting to hear the reasons why videos weren't on. Often it was um, either cultural amongst their, their, their age group. That's not how they used to correspond to communicating with each other. But also there, were, um, there was embarrassment around the, their background, perhaps the room they were in, um, about how they were presenting personally, you know, during lockdown, were, you know, just 
in how they were dressed or what have you. Um, so I think acknowledging what the reasons for not turning on the video were were really important in then encouraging students to do that. The way that we're trying to approach it now is by building the video part of it into the reason for the lesson. So for example, here we are in a webinar where I've got my camera on and hopefully that's making it more accessible to people listening. And so we're mimicking a sort of a workplace scenario in our lessons when we're asking students to put on their video. And I think framing it as such, and that's, it's a work in progress. That's not the, you know, the, I'm not saying that we've got the answer, but I think that helps if we're talking about this is actually mimicking a triage that you might have online with a the patient, then the reason for the camera becomes a lot more a lot more obvious. Michelle, did you have anything to add? No, thank you, Irene. I mean, I think that's been our experience as well throughout COVID and even now. I mean, we very much, I guess, learnt a lot during that time and we've taken the best of our experience in the online learning environment and coupled it with face-to-face -face learning. Um, but we still find that when we deliver synchronous sessions, students are reluctant to, um, I guess, fully engage virtually. So it, it, it is it is a work in progress. That's something that we can um, certainly improve on, providing students do want to engage in that way. And I think it enhances the learning experience significantly. I should just say, I mean, I'm I'm putting into the webinar chat the various links to um, the technology that we referred to that's free. Um, I think that might be useful and I'll, I'll just continue to do that so people can access it. Brilliant, Michelle, thank you so much. Um, I'd also like to say, um, you know, we, we, we're we talking and the presenters are talking, but you probably also have some really good experiences or you may have some apps or websites that you've used and, and found useful. So please feel free to share via the Q&A or the chat if you're able to access the, the chat. Um, it'd be lovely to hear about some, some tips and hints you may have if you've had some good experiences in this regard. Good. Um, and just to say, um, I've posted in the chat as well a link to a, to a quick survey. Um, we were we're really keen to hear what you thought of the of the webinar and to help us improve future future webinars. But also, as the journal, we want to you know I think that these webinars have been a real first step in engaging more with our readers, with all of you, and making sure that we are you know meeting each other and um, that we're providing the type of content that's really the most useful to you. Um, and so we're embarking on a program of engaging and involving readers in groups to plan future issues of the journal. And um, so we've already had a meeting with readers about the medicines issue, which is going to be coming out in um, around March time next year. But we've got a few other issues planned for the rest of 2023. And it'd be fantastic if you could fill in the form, give us a bit of feedback about today and, and the webinar. And then there's a place to say if you would be keen to be involved in planning future issues of the journal. Um, it would be lovely to have more of you on board. And also, um, if you want us to, you can say whether you're willing to be involved um, in giving feedback about the journal or feedback about this topic in specific, specifically. So thank you. And um, with that, I'll just check, are there any other questions that have come on that haven't been answered yet? Good. OK, so um, I'll repost that link to the survey again, um, and then we'll move on now to um, Hilary Rono. So you're going to be talking about um, a project in Kenya, in health in Kenya. Thank you. Please take it away, Rhonda. Thank you very much. Uh, did you want me to uh, present? I, I, I present for my laptop. Is it possible? Well, we've we've got the you've, we've got your slides on the screen. Are you able to oh, see them? And then I just take the slide, and, and he will kindly move us forward. Thank you. No problem. I think let, let's continue. Yes. Next. Yeah, so I, um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm Dr. Rono. I'm going to present on the um, how we overcame challenges in our health system using uh, M Health. Uh, initially, in Kenya, we used to have uh, we we do have we, did, we had the community programs and we had school programs. And uh, for school programs, what we know was that um, there are very few children who have uh, visual impairment. Generally, uh, next. Generally, we know that um, there are about uh, four to five percent of uh, school-going children who have visual impairment. That actually translates to about uh, one child in every twenty-five 
who have um, a visual impairment. So initially when we started in Kenya, next. Initially when we started, uh, next. Next. Next, please. <clears throat> I'm just w wondering, um, this looks like it's quite tricky. Um, um, Shell, would it be easier for you to share the slides yourself? Is that is that going to be possible? There we go. Oh, we've... Are you back? Hi. I sorry. What happened? I'm not uh, not sure. We lost you for a moment there, Rodo. But I think I'm not sure if um the slide sharing uh was working entirely from our side. Would you prefer to share that? Uh, yeah, there you go. Can you see me? Now? Can you see my slide now? Yes, we can. Yes, perfect. Yes. Yeah. Good. So I was saying that um, yeah, in in school children, for example, there were uh, about five. Uh, in every hundred had a visual impairment. That translates to about one in every 25. So what we used to do before was that we, said, we used to send nurses to go and screen, uh, to do school screening, which means we would actually send one nurse to screen 24 children who are normal only to find one and refer to the hospital. And in that time, because of the few human resources we used to have, we used to close the clinic uh, to actually have a school screening going on. Then it eventually said, probably maybe it's not a good use of, of our time to send nurses. So we send, uh, we, we, we train teachers through the same screening at, at school and refer only those ones who had um, eye problems. So initially we used to use um, a distumbling E and uh, paper and paper referral to come to hospital. But children would not actually come to hospital as the way we would have expected them. So we train them how to use people. Right eye. Show me the direction of this. Rana, we seem to have lost you. Um, is it perhaps worth perhaps not showing the video? I think might be causing uh, problems. Yeah, I've also I've also lost um, Dr. Rono, unfortunately. Um, let's just see. I think he's just logging back in. We'll give it a moment. Hi. Okay, sorry. I, I think there's a problem with our internet uh, where we are. It could I be the bit. Could you skip over the video, perhaps? Because um, that might be what's causing the bandwidth issue. If you could. Uh, okay. That's yeah. right. Super. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank you. Thank All thank you. good. Thank you for the advice. So let me. Okay. So. Yes, so as soon as the teachers send uh, a, a child um, fail a test, the teachers actually gathered more information and they just send them to the hospital. And immediately they click the send button. We were able to see at the server of the hospital. As you can see there, we, we, have, uh, we were expecting about 60 children from a school called Mubutu. Another one, the first one about 14 children. And we were able to plan on when to come. Immediately as well, Immediately as well, uh, the parents were sent a text message uh, on, on when to report to hospital. So what we did was uh, we did a trial, which uh, one arm we were able to use the standard uh, method, which was using the the, the uh, sampling E and the paper referral, and another arm we used PIC. And uh, we, we, we randomized 25 schools in each, uh, in each arm. And eventually, what we found out was that um, our outcome measure was basically attendance of, um, of hospital within uh, eight, 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 eight weeks. And what we found out was that um, 
uh, in the arm, which was uh, for tumbling E, around 22% attended. And in the ones for peak arm, actually about 54% attended. And if you look at it, most of the first one week, you would see that um, they were attending similarly. Those are the people who are early responders. But as soon as we were able to send more text messages they were using peak system, then we were able to more attend. Then we found that they had exams and of course schools closed. And that's why the, the, two, the two graphs flattened. Overall, we had a 22% attendance from the standard arm. And of course, 54% using the M Health peak technology at that perspective. And there was evidence for, for, for that. And these results were published in the Lancet. So based on that, on those results, then we were able to scale up to cover all the schools in the Transoya County, that was 400 schools, about um, 200,000 children. And overall, we were able to screen 168,000, of which we found there's over 6,500 with the eye problems, and we were able to treat about 93% of them. That gave us a, um, at least some confidence that we could actually um, use uh, M Health technology at least to solve problems in school. But we also had uh, similar challenges in the community. In the community, we found that uh, we had a similar challenges, and we used to have community volunteers going from house to house to screen. So we thought we could also train them on, on peak. So we use the same principles that we were using in schools and train community volunteers. So when they were going house to house, they would actually uh, screen people using peak system and then uh, geotag them and refer those people who had uh, eye problems to a triage center like a dispensary. And from that point, those who cannot be treated at triage, then they are referred further to go to hospital where they'll be operated or uh, refracted in the hospital. So we had actually uh, in the community, community volunteers uh, referring using peak system at the primary health facility as well being referred and to the secondary facility. So uh, at that time then we had to do this as a trial. Our unit of intervention was a community unit, which is defined as a health facility together with its catchment population. So in Transoya, we had about 66 community um, units. And for that, we randomly selected 36. And that was, of those 36, uh, 18 were randomized towards the peak arm, and the 18 were used to, to the control. Our outcome measure then was, of course, the, 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 the appropriateness of, of the referral and the time that they took to actually come to, um, to, to reach the primary facility. And what we found out is that uh, out of 1,000 population, who are sensitized, if you use the normal paper referral what we are using before, we found that um, about 54 would respond uh, self, uh, and actually re refer themselves to hospital. And if we use speak and do active screening from door to door, we found that out of the 1,000 people in the community would actually identify 150 of them with high problems. And um, when they were seen by the health, uh, eye doctors or physicians, we found 52 in the standard arm, compared to 143 in, um, in, in, in the peak arm. And of course, that, uh, there was evidence that, that there was a true difference for that. Of course, there were false positives, which was about 3.8% in the standard arm, and of course, 48 in the peak arm. But there was no evidence of a difference in the two of them. So this actually gave us that um, using uh, M health solution this time peak, actually, uh, attendance of primary health facility was, uh, attendance was nearly tripled compared to use the um, the, the usual method of paper and referral. And this gave us more evidence that actually we could use uh, M Health to improve access to both uh, eye services, both in schools and of course in the communities. So of course this uh, evidence as well was, was published as well in the Lancet. And uh, based on that, we found that there were still people who when they were referred to hospital, they didn't attend. So we did a qualitative study to find out why they were not attending and what were the barriers they were um, encompassing. And what we found out was that uh, at that time, um, the, um, the, apart from the cost, uh, distance and all those, the biggest barrier was that the health workers didn't have time to actually discuss with the patients on why they need to go to hospital. So actually it was proposed that this need for counseling or some form of health education and time with the patients on the need for the referral, that would be to improve. And based on that, on that, then we have also now um, advanced uh, using PEAK 
uh, to cover at least around 10 counties of 10 regions, both for school program and school and uh, community program. And we hope in the, in the next two years with support from CBM uh, and the Kenyan government and the county government as well, we will reach more than 8 million people. So far the program has started and I think we have so far reached, started about two months ago and we are so far in about 100,000 population. Thank you very much. And uh, I, would, I would like to support, uh, acknowledge the support we got from partners, the Minister of Health and the county government and the communities as well. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you so much for that for that fantastic talk, um, Rono. That's fantastic. Um, really, really interesting. I'd love to open up for questions. Do we have any any Q and A questions coming in for for Dr. Rono? Um, I just think this is a, a, one of the key strengths of this approach, um, both this one and, and, and Dr. Owens in Pakistan, is that it reduces the burden on, um, on tertiary centres and secondary eye centres, so people who can get the support they need at primary IK level are referred appropriately. Um, so that's fantastic, and also just improving access in general. And um, what what did you say, what would you say, Rona, were the, were the key obstacles um, that you faced? And I, I just wanted to also say I, I thought it was brilliant that when you noticed people were still not coming, even though you'd improved so much on the, on what had happened, when people were still not coming, you you did qualitative research. Um, and I just want to say what a good thing it is to actually ask people what is going on, and that we do need to actually speak to people. But anyway, please please talk a bit about that if you could. Yeah, um, th thank you. Um, what we found out as uh, some of the barriers um, really, um, it, it, it was quite interesting. So one of them is that people will actually tell you it's about the cost, the distance, but if you interrogate them further, you find that there is some element of um, that they didn't know why they were being referred to um, to more to another center for treatment. Yet, of course, there are health workers who had come to treat, treat them. So one of them actually, it, it brought us to think that probably we needed to have more uh, team composition and then increase more of a team composition for the people who are coming to primary facilities so that you don't have to refer multiple times the participants to go to the six services. That's what we found out. And then number two, it, uh, it gave us the hint that probably there's need for comprehensiveness of eye health services. And it, it is best provided at the first contact, at the first point of contact with the health workers. And if you, the more you delay in providing that comprehensive services, then you, the more you lose people in that. And then there's also much more need for intersectoral collaboration and that there is need for more stakeholders to be involved, uh, that not all of them are need to be health actors, even that health actors needed to be involved as well. Which other actors did you say needed to be involved? Non-health non non -health actors, yes. I was just gonna say actually, because one of the things that I, I think has been the weaknesses for, for eye health is that it's operated in a bit of a silo in its own world. And the movement going on internationally with um, eye health now being on the WHO, World Health Organization agenda, on the United Nations agenda, that the answer really is to partner partner up with other services. So for example, doing some eye screening of, um, of parents when, with maternal and child health services as well. So bridging the gap between, um, between eye care and other health services and other general services. Um, our issue on primary eye health care also really emphasized partnership. Uh, we've got a raised a question in the um, in the chat, and um, also one a raised hand from Michelle. So I've just seen the questions moved on. Um, oh, I think has it been answered from Liam O'Toole, and I see Dr. Arwen has also answered that. Michelle, I will get to you in a second. Um, so Liam asked for people that cannot travel to hospitals, eye care centres, is there mobile eye care available? Um, so. CBM, Dr. Arwen's reply, he said, no, because this is not a sustainable mechanism, mobile IK. CBM aims to strengthen IK systems. Um, now, Liam, did you mean people with disabilities? Because that's also that sort of equity of access for people with disabilities is really important. Um, would you like to speak to that first, Rono, and then I'll bring in Dr. Arwan. Um yeah, I think on your first, uh, you are spot on in terms of uh, the element of 
moving primary health care into in an integrated way, approach to primary, I mean primary eye care in a, integrated together with primary health care. And I think as well, going the technological way, which are, I mean, technologies which are more integrated would actually much more advantage, be advantageous because we will take advantage of much more um, other departments and other opportunities that patients might have in contact with the health system. So I think much more as a eye care, we would need to see how we can actually interact much more with the health system. Uh, we can interact much more with our peers in the health, health sector and see how we can offer services together. And I think there's a, a move towards that direction in, in terms of integrating into primary health care and seeing how it would work. Mm -hmm. On the other bit of, uh, I agree with um, Dr. Saeed in terms of uh, strengthening primary health care. Yes, there's still this need for strengthening primary health care and providing services in those, in those areas as close as possible to the people. But still, they are very weak ones. I mean, there are people who need support in terms of um, um, facilitation to, to, to get secondary services and others. So there is still some element that we need to support some few people, but majority needs to be provided as, as close as possible to where they are. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rana. Um, let me just check. If, yeah, I'm unmuted. Dr. Alvin, did you want to speak to that briefly? We've got a minute for that, and then I'd like to get on to um, Michelle, who raised her hand with another question. Yes, thank you very much. Actually, just I wanted to speak about the person with disabilities, as you mentioned. Yes. <clears throat> that for in our programs, we have a special uh, pro special arrangements for the person with disabilities because our mandate is to improve the quality of life of people with disabilities. What we do in our programs, we in our social organizations, we have a social organization. They used to visit at the smallest administrative unit that is called Union Council, and if they find that there that a person with disability, number of persons with disabilities are living in pockets, then we organize a mechanism, we send an, our optometrist to that area where he examines, screens, examines, and refracts. And if anyone who needs a spectacle or surgery, for the surgery, we used to provide them the vehicle, take them to the secondary or tertiary level. For the spectacles, they, our optical shops, they prepare for them and and hand it over to them in their houses. So this is the mechanism for, especially for the person with disabilities, but not for uh, for the able people. Because if we used to take the able people in line, we don't have, uh, we cannot sustain this mechanism. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you. Important point. Um, Michelle, Dr. Henley, please. Thanks, Elmine, uh, and thanks, Rono, for a fantastically interesting talk. I guess I wanted to ask whether the eye diseases that were revealed, were they expected in terms of what you found for pediatric patients and also those in the community? And then I also wanted to ask about the support around visual impairment, should an intervention not be successful or indeed um, an intervention would, would help to resolve the, the issue. Is there enough support around that? Um, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, in terms of um, disease conditions, at primary level, what we found out was that we were able to really treat and manage most of the conditions at primary level. And it gave us, um, this included allergies, a little bit of uh, infections, really, and uh, people didn't have to travel all the way. And we could, we could actually decongest our secondary facilities by actually strengthening our primary, which was one of the strengths that we found out. There are children as well who, and even the adults who we could not manage at primary level. So we referred them to secondary facilities. Some we could manage there, but there are some who still could not be managed and we needed to refer them to tertiary facilities. At that time, then I had support from um, other partners as well, who could actually um, be able to meet some of the transport costs to, to those centers. However, for the patients as well, if you discuss with them comfortably, and if, for example, they have insurance, they are actually able to travel to those centers. And as long as you link them to the relevant uh, health personnel, they are able to do that. So in, in, in a nutshell, yes, we needed to have a whole connect connection from primary to a tertiary facility, but the people going to tertiary were very few. 
Brilliant. Thank you so much, Rona. Um, we've, we've just gone over our time. I'm very conscious of that. So I'm going to ask all our panelists to please turn on your cameras and you as well, our host. Um, and thank you as our participants and journal readers, and perhaps you're new to the journal. Um, thank you so much for coming today. And thank you for your questions and your fantastic engagement. And thank you so much to our panelists for their time and their very busy days. Um, we're really keen to hear from you. Um, again, and uh, what we're going to do is, is the, the contact, the, the recording of the webinar and information about the, the articles will be um, will be shared with you via email if you've signed up to, to when you signed up to to this webinar. Um, so we really look forward to seeing you. Um, Hugh, is there anything else from your side? I'm not sure if I forget anything. No, no, that's no, also yeah. The, the recording will be available um, uh, over email, and we'll also put it up on our website. And yeah, thanks again so much for everyone. For Fantastic. And do remember to fill in that form. And if you are keen to help us plan future issues, we're really keen on your perspectives and your experiences and for us to reflect that. So please do um, do fill in that form and let us know. We look forward to seeing you at reader meetings and engaging with you at future webinars. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll say goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, bye, everyone. Bye. Oh, thanks, everyone. Oh, I'm going to take a picture. Panelists, please stay where you are and keep smiling and waving. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, take it.